This is a recording of another extract from The Ruin of Cash by Roberto Calasso and I'm going to be reading a little bit from his chapter called On Taste from page 88 and in this chapter one key point that he talks about is the secularization of the word. This is interesting because my doctorate looked at this whole question of how we conceive of a word. What is the function of a word in our culture? For my doctorate, I was looking at the esoteric dimensions of the word. So in many cultures, the uttering of a word or the uttering of a set of words is seen to access higher levels of reality, spiritual dimensions. In the case of Mande culture, it's supposed to release what was called Nyama, which is some kind of occult energy and those who are entitled to recite epics of certain heroes, for example, the epic of Sunjata Keita, they are called Nyama Kalao, people who manage Nyama, people who manage this spiritual energy that is released by uttering a word. We see the same in Islamic culture. Islam is a religion, for want of a better word. Islam is a way of life based upon the word, based upon the utterance of words via a prophet. And the Quran is a collection of words that we are encouraged to say every day, read every day, utter every day. And those words, when uttered, are considered to have certain effects in our lives and in the next world as well. So actually, when we think about what is a word, what is the conception of a word in society, we can see how in the development of modern literature, the word became something that was to an extent flat. When we look at structuralism, post-structuralism, for example, then we see that words are literally just conceived of as marks on a page. And this is something that Colesso touches upon in his chapter, how literature became detached, disengaged, deracinated from spiritual and ethical underpinnings. We see in the 19th century people talking about art for art's sake. And so I think that here in this chapter, Colasso is also talking about literature for literature's sake. The development of literature as a thing to use modern day parlance and the evaporation of any sense of moral, spiritual dimensions to the uttering of a word. Just quickly to go back to West African culture, for example, Mali again. So there were people who had an official role, which was to speak as public speakers. Not everybody 
had the privilege of being allowed to speak. This is quite interesting. Of course, many people might say that's outrageous and how anti-democratic that is. But it does highlight something else. It highlights that the handling of words is a perilous engagement and that only those who are trained and qualified and initiated should technically be allowed to utter words publicly. So in Colasso's chapter on taste, he talks about a moving away from ethics and spirituality and a moving towards the importance of taste. How something looks, how something sounds. And taste comes to replace the deeper dimensions of the word. Taste in literature and taste in the written and spoken word is all part of this moving away from the ethical and spiritual dimensions of what it is to be a human being and the human being's connection to their esoteric dimensions. So he says, taste comes into being in order to inherit what exactly? Hard to say, but surely in all the civilizations that the reactionaries dreamed of, taste did not exist. Meaning was enough to suppress it, and meaning must sway on its foundations before taste can appear. So the meaning behind communication or the meaning behind words, and this is not just a secular idea of meaning, we could say what is meant here is a multidimensional form of meaning, But meaning has to no longer be of any value before taste then becomes something of value. So he says, taste is now the hallmark of initiation. It is applied to everything and to nothing in particular. It is the seal on one's existence, the final replacement for a wisdom that one cannot even allude to without displaying bad taste. And I think this does go for many societies where to even hint at a deeper level to our human existence is seen as, yeah, distasteful because it's giving an uncomfortable reminder of the fact that we are mortal and the fact that life isn't just a game. People often have a horror of referring to any kind of wisdom. Definitely prefer to occupy themselves with the trivia of conversation. But in the upper classes and the educated classes, that trivia has to be expressed with good taste. So I like this comment that he makes here, that the French language, beginning with Pascal, became the language of the perfect honnête homme. That is, the language of the perfectly civilised man. Shortly before being confined, 
and almost strangled by the short sentences that Voltaire made so popular, the Onit Om had strolled around in the empty space between two chairs, and something still reminded him of a sinuous quiver, a reflection in clear water, only slightly muddied. I like the way that he describes Voltaire as strangling the French language with short sentences. And yes, in the 19th century, French was seen as the language of the perfectly civilised man. Even in England, it was seen as vulgar to use Anglo-Saxon-derived words, Anglo-Saxon-derived vocabulary, and it was seen as more polite and educated to use French-derived words. Then he says, the bourgeois age was sick with history and it was responsible for its occasional display of arrogant euphoria. But no one dared note that this sickness was the consequence of an impalpable fact, namely, that the familial knot connecting the present to the past had been severed. So yes, the knot connecting the present to our past has been severed. Again, when I was doing my doctorate on esoteric dimensions of Francophone Islamic literature, there was a short monograph on the work of Sheikh Hamid Kane who I wrote on. This monograph was by someone called J.P. Little, and she talked about the rootless intellectualism of secular Europe. And this seems to be linked, or seems to be similar to what Kalasso is saying here, that with the rise of the bourgeoisie and industrialization and a kind of intoxication with these rapid technological developments, there is an abandonment of the past, a complete abandonment. I mean, some things from the past should be abandoned. They're not good. But I've argued for 20 years that what there has been in some ways is an almost wholesale abandonment without much consideration of what is being lost. And we find what has been lost in modern secular Europe, outside of Europe, in Muslim majority countries, which are also in the process of moving towards rootless intellectualism. Another comment that I like that he makes here is, in the life of a politician, insults do not matter. Only humiliations matter. I like that. Bearing in mind the scandals that our politicians go through. And then he he quotes another writer here. The disease of literature and of art, it is said, is very common in our time. Perhaps never before, I dare say, have phrase and colour, the falseness of the literary word, so predominated over content and truth as in recent years. The reign of the pen has replaced, literally, the reign of the sword. Just as Marx would relentlessly chronicle, through its small stages, the emancipation of exchange value, so saint beuve minutely observed the emancipation of the word. It was a process in which he saw himself as an accomplice, though at the same time it repelled him. 
Charles Augustin de Saint Beuve was a 19th century literary critic and also a failed novelist, according to his biographers. Colasso continues, out of that same odious proliferation would arise the new, which Saint Beuve, in the timid reaches of his mind, was not prepared to follow, even if his clairvoyance kept him from being unaware of it. The new of Baudelaire, then of Flaubert, both carried away by absolute literature. The degraded word and the perfect word were preparing to mingle their waters as in certain Gnostic rituals. Saint Beuve, who always refused to go one step beyond good and evil, now realised with dismay that in the world around him there existed no basis or truth on which he could lean. And of course there is a reference to Nietzsche, beyond good and evil. And according to Saint Beuve's biographers, Nietzsche couldn't stand Saint Beuve. So here are some interesting observations from Roberto Colasso about the abandonment of our connections to our heritage, not just a cultural heritage, but a spiritual, esoteric heritage. And with that severing, what is replacing it? The superficial and the meaningless and the valueless and the art for art's sake and the absolute literature, literature for literature's sake, that is what is replacing it. Of course this cannot be taken as an absolute observation in itself. But we can say that since the 19th century and going into the 20th century, this has been the general trend. So thank you for listening. And I'll upload another recording soon.